Hello, my name is Alex Flood. I'm a radiography instructor, and in this video I'll be talking about um, radiation safety practices with regard to protecting the patient, including um, things like uh, patient shielding and uh, guidelines for equipment. So hang in there for the next few minutes and we'll talk about uh, radiation safety. So patient, sh patient shielding, um, you know, we shield the patient to, uh, and in a radiography suite, we're not so much worried about, um, you know, the somatic effects of radiation, the effects that are going to happen to an individual. We're really worried about um, mitigating the risk uh, for genetic effects, these hereditary effects that can happen from uh, exposure to, um, uh, you know, chronic exposure to radiation or um, acute doses of radiation, um, as can be found in the radiography suite, um, not high enough to cause, again, somatic change, but high enough potentially to cause um, the stochastic changes that are uh, associated with late-term effects, um, changes to the genes that uh, we hand down, our sex cells. Um, so anyways, we want to shield the patient's um, gonads um, from the path of the primary beam. Um, so that's the purpose of, of gonadal shielding. Um, so there's several different types of gonadal shielding. Um, there's the contact shield. Um, those can include lap or half shields, lead aprons, and leaded rubber cutouts placed directly on the patient. Now these um, contact shields are actually uh, not designed for use um, in the primary beam path. Um, these are designed to absorb scatter radiation. So a good example of this would be the type of shield that you would see used um, either worn to the usually to the front of the patient at their waist level for a chest x-ray for example for what uh, you know for uh, mitigating the absorption of uh, backscatter within the patient. Um, <clears throat> Other types of shields include uh, shaped gonadal shields, and these ones are designed specifically for the gonads. It, we're always shielding the gonads for the most part, um, and um, there's some other radiosensitive organs like the thyroid, for example, but for the most part, all of our shielding is, is an effort to um, cover the gonads and limit gonad exposure. Now, um, to be clear, you know, we can't eliminate um, the internal scatter radiation that occurs when a patient's exposed to the x-ray beam, but we can stop uh, absorption of like backscatter with the contact shields. We can stop absorption uh, within the gonads of the primary beam. Um, that's the purpose of the shaped gonadal and shadow shields. Um, and that brings me to the shadow shield. Shadow shields are actually the one depicted in that little uh, picture there. Uh, basically they hang off of the collimator box and um, they don't touch the patient. The advantage to that is, um, you know, uh, one, one advantage is you can um, adjust the shadow shield to make it larger or smaller, to, so the shadow cast is larger or smaller. Um, they don't actually have to touch the patient, so they work good in um, sterile fields uh, like those uh, we encounter in surgical radiography. In any case, um, more likely in the general radiogra radiography suites, we're talking about shaped gonadal shields and contact shields. For the most part, contact shields are designed to be used outside of the primary beam path, even though they might share the same lead uh, thickness and attenuation capabilities of the shaped gonadal shields. They're not designed for that. The shaped gonadal shields are designed to be placed over the gonads and to shield the gonads from the primary beam. So when should we shield the gonads? So the regulations say, um, these are NCRP recommendations that have been adopted by the ARRT and subsequently um, used by the uh, by national uh, associations and as well as a state and, um, and further down the line adopted by local, um, local uh, organizations as well as your, uh, your medical offices. So the patient's gonads must be shielded any time they lie within five centimeters, that's two inches, of the edge of a properly collimated beam, unless covering that area will hide information that could aid in the diagnosis. So that's a way of saying, you know, we shield the gonads when the primary beam is near the gonads, um, when the edge of the primary beam makes it near the gonads, unless shielding the gonads covers our uh, useful information, you know, the anatomy that we want to demonstrate. Um, leaded rubber sheets can be used as a as a backup to collimated field edges, which are frequently inaccurate. So um, yeah, um, a good example of that is I really like the leaded rubber sheets used um, 
at the posterior aspect of the patient for things like a lateral thoracic or lateral lumbar spines because that extra thick body tends to scatter a lot of, of x-rays and uh, leads to modeling on the image, uh, excuse me, pardon, pardon me, fogging on the image. And um, we, we can eliminate some of that by putting a leaded rubber sheet right at the edge of the collimated field, just in, maybe even just in from the edge of the collimated field. And um, it doesn't, so the leaded rubber sheets don't lower patient exposure because um, they're placed on the tabletop or the image receptor themselves, but they do uh, clean up the images a little bit um, and they're, they're used for that reason. So to be clear, leaded rubber sheets are not a type of patient shielding, uh, typically. We don't typically use red leaded rubber sheets for patient shielding. Um, for procedures in which shielding is not scientifically indicated, if the patient has expressed any concern, it may be wise to use it anyway, um, strictly from a public relations standpoint. So the way I th talk about it is, um, you know, you wanna make your patients feel comfortable and anything you can do to make them feel comfortable in the x-ray room is gonna improve their experience and improve the um, quality of care we can offer them. So we'll go ahead and shield. If a patient wants a thyroid shield and it's not gonna cover anatomy, I'm gonna shield the thyroid, even though we know pretty well thyroid shields are used uh, by the radiologists um, and, and, and uh, radiographers during uh, fluoroscopy and, and things like that. In any case, I should also mention here that um, it hasn't been adopted by the ARRT yet, but there's been a new report from the NCRP, uh, not a report, pardon me, a statement from the NCRP, they called it statement number 13, it's worth looking into, um, in which they are recommending ending gonadal shielding um, under some circumstances, which include things like pelvic and abdominal radiography. So it's something to look into um, in maybe the next coming years, these uh, guidelines might be um, adjusted a little bit. But for now, this is what we're sticking with. This is what you should expect on your ARRT or state certification exams. Um, so we need to understand that um, Lead, as, as we, uh, you know, we look at the uh, history of x-rays and we talk about how Rankin did his experiments on x-rays and he discovered things like x-rays are stopped by lead. While that's largely true, it's not 100% true because um, lead, well, x-rays have a low linear energy transfer. That means they're highly penetrating. They can pass through things. Um, lead's a very dense um, type of matter, but it still doesn't attenuate 100% of the x-ray beam under really any circumstances. So the number I'm going to give you guys here, uh, the general effectiveness of a lead shield, um, and these are um, these are our uh, half millimeter lead shields, is roughly 85%. Okay, so on a ballpark average at, at, at average KV levels, we're talking about 85% attenuation, so 15% of the beam is not attenuated. Um, this can range from 66 to 99%, depending on lead thickness and KV levels. Um, a very thick shield, like a one millimeter shield, will attenuate far more than a quarter millimeter shield. Um, high KVP is more penetrating than low KVP. Um, a number worth remembering is a half millimeter lead shield at, at a 75 KVP um, is, uh, attenuates approximately 88% of the primary beam. So these are shields used in the primary beam fat. They do attenuate a large majority of the x-ray beam, significantly lowering entrance skin exposure and patients absorbed dose um, to the areas that are covered. Um, so they work, um, but they're not 100% effective. Uh, the, the, they do lower the absorbed dose though. Policies regarding pregnant patients. Um, the patient should be provided with educational materials. Um, we strongly recommend providing patients uh, with educational materials like brochures, videotapes in the waiting areas, etc. And um, what we want the patient to know is um, any patient, any female patient of childbearing age, we want to know if they could be pregnant. Um, so if you are a radiographer and you have an exam and you go to ask your patient, is there any chance you could be pregnant? Um, and they say, well, I'm not sure, or they say it's possible, or they say I've missed my period, or they say, I'm, you know, well, I'm not necessarily trying, but I'm not using birth control and I'm sexually active. Um, anything that's not a, a for sure, no, I'm not pregnant, or no, there's no possibility that I'm pregnant. We wanna go ahead and um, 
refer to the either the radiologist, the supervising x-ray tech, or potentially the ordering physician um, for uh, instructions on how to proceed from there. It could be that we just um, shield heavily. Um, it could be that we just uh, run a pregnancy test, a, an HCG, human, human chorionic gonadotropin uh, test on urine, and uh, we get an answer pretty quickly. Um, and so, but either way, we want to um, have somebody with uh, more say so than us uh, go ahead and give us the, uh, you know, the what to do there. Um, for non-urgent procedures, um, you know, if you don't have a, the ability to talk to, uh, you know, radiologist or ordering physician, um, you can uh, just have the patient have an electively scheduled exam, uh, having a procedure done, you know, within uh, waiting then, and having the procedure done within 10 days following the onset of menses. Um, you know, most x-ray exams that we're performing are under the urgent or emergent category, else we, or else we likely may not be doing it. Um, so, yeah, that's when we're going to either turn to the ordering physician, you know, in a small doctor's office, urgent care setting, go talk to the ordering physician. In the hospital setting, you need to kind of refer to the... Um, either the supervising tech, uh, the radiology department, manage, supervisor, um, radiologist. So anyways, you, you got to go to somebody who can give you the say-so if the patient thinks they could be pregnant. Um, so some patient pregnancy policies. So it's, it's important to understand that um, when a radiation exposure has occurred to a developing embryo, due to a pregnancy unknown, unknown at the time, or to an emergency procedure, Whatever the entrance skin exposure, whatever the dose, the calculated dose was to the to the mom, to mom, um, the fetal dose is estimated to be about one third of the entrance skin exposure, and that's just because you know the the fetus lies um, under you know um, uh, in uh, under uh, deep to the uh, to the uh, you know the abdominal wall, the uterine wall. Um, the fluid in there. So anyways, um, the fetus's entrance skin exposure will be largely uh, lower, will be just a fraction of what mom's entrance skin exposure is. Um, abortion should never be counseled by medical personnel if the estimated embryo fetal dose is less than 100 milligray. Um, 100 milligray is a tenth of a gray. Um, that would cover most situations in diagnostic imaging. We're not going to be getting to, you know, 100 milligray on really almost any exam, except when you're talking about, you know, fluoroscopy potentially, CT scans, those kind of things. Um, even, even, you know, contrast abdominal radiography, you're going to have a hard time getting to those, those exposure levels. The reason why that levels um, given to use because at 100 milligray, um, especially early on first trimester stuff, there's a large risk to um, congenital defects um, to the developing embryo. So yeah, above 100 milligray, you want to consider that. And, um, you know, and, and we're not doing these on purpose. If this is, we're talking about um, unknown pregnancies or emergency procedures that uh, might need to be like, you know, think, think like a motor vehicle accident where, you know, in order for baby to survive, mom has to survive and we've got to get a diagnosis on what's going on with, you know, for example, trauma to the mother. And um, in some cases, like, like usually what we would think about is like a CT scan, they might not know they're pregnant or might not be able to tell you they're pregnant. And um, there would be a um, unknown Expo, you know, exposure to an if developing embryo that was at the time unknown. Anyways, um, fetal exposures above 250 milligray pose a substantial uh, increase in risk for congenital defects. Such a level of exposure um, requiring the mom to get an entrance skin exposure of 750 milligray uh, in order for the fetus to get 250 are very rare for diagnostic procedures. Uh, recall that um, at the level of one gray, that's the level at which um, uh, the dose is considered to be potentially lethal, in which the acute radiation syndrome start up. Um, we're really, anyways, the, these doses that they're quoting here, these are not, unless it's a whole body CT scan, the doses are not going to be, um, you know, to the whole body. These are partial body doses, even at these high levels. So just keep that in mind. We have to account there's account for the fact that there's not an entire body being irradiated here. But it is, but there is a potential that the, uh, like an abdominal radiograph, you know, if an, if an abdominal radiography got to, for whatever reason, got to those levels, which it's not going to, but just hear me out if it did, um, you know, an entire fetus could be 
could be irradiated. And you know, and if, if for whatever reason if the mom got three quarters of a gray, 750 milligray, to the abdomen, it, there's a potential for the fetus to get you know up to 250 milligray to the entire fetus. So even though the entire mom, entire mother wasn't irradiated, uh, whole body, um, the fetus could be whole body irradiated simply because they're so much smaller. Some equipment guidelines, um, exposure switches, including fluoroscopy foot switches, drive switches on mobile units, shall be of the dead man's type. This is taken from train conductor terminology, where it, um, if a train conductor were to, for some reason, die while driving a train, they would fall away from their uh, control handle, the throttle control, and the train stops. Um, for us, the dead man switch requires that if we set an exposure time for a half of a second, We've got to depress the switch and keep it depressed for at least a half of a second. If you let up on the button before the timer has gone off, the exposure will stop. This is a protective measure um, for our x-ray equipment. Um, fluoroscopy, uh, routinely operating above 90 kVp, should have at least 3 millimeters of aluminum equivalent filtration. Um, if you recall, um, X-ray tubes operating above 70 kVp have to have two and a half millimeters uh, minimum for uh, aluminum filtration, aluminum or aluminum equivalent filtration. Mammography gets less filtration because they operate at low kV uh, levels, um, and that's because they 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 have uh, they they could use they make use of the um, narrower energy spectrum for the x-ray beam at those low kVs, offering them high contrast. Most x-ray equipment, most diagnostic equipment, except for fluoroscopy, high, high energy fluoroscopy, we're talking about two and a half millimeters of filtration operating above 70 kVp. And number three, devices connected to the collimator should ensure that the tube to tabletop distance shall not be less than for fixed units, 15 inches. For mobile units, 12 inches. You know, most of that distance is made up from the collimator um, and, the, and the mounting for the collimator, keeping the distances far. But you'll notice like mobile units have, um, usually on the bottom of the collimator, there's like um, a bar or two. And those bars are there to keep the uh, distance from the tube to the tabletop. So we're talking about the, the um, the source of radiation on the anode, the distance from that to the tabletop shall not be less than 15 inches for fixed and 12 inches for mobile. Plastic cones, this is what I was saying on the previous slide, plastic cones on the left or metal rails on the right, typically installed on smaller collimators. A large collimator would make up the distance just because of the size of the box, but a small collimator might not. Um, these small collimators might have, again, these plastic cones or rails, and that keeps the tube target on a mobile unit or a fixed unit. Um, on the left is a C-arm, on the right is a mobile unit um, from being brought close, closer than 12 inches to the, to the uh, patient. Number four, during fluoroscopy, a five minute cumulative timer must emit an audible signal at five minutes, accumulated beam on time. So this is not like a running timer when you start your exam. This is a timer that counts down as long as your beam is on. So as it, when your beam is on, there's a timer counting. Once we get to five minutes, it's an audible timer. Um, Radiographers should not impede the function of the timer, but they can reset the timer. Um, but it's the radiographer's responsibility to alert the radiologist. Um, they can be busy with their exam, they might not notice. So alert the radiologist when we've hit the five minute cumulative fluoro time. So just, you know, just let them know, hey, hey, you know, doctor, we've reached the five minute cumulative fluoro time and they'll tell you reset the timer or they'll make their decision, but it's your job to keep an eye on that. Uh, fluoroscopic collimator shutters shall be visible on the TV monitor at all times fluoroscopy is engaged. Lastly, uh, this is a fluoroscopic note, fluoroscopic exposure at the tabletop shall not exceed 100 milligray per minute nor 21 milligray per minute per, per MA. Um, now I know radio, uh, UX rate limited techs are used to seeing um, high MA levels. Just know that um, fluoroscopic uh, units operate in the single digits for MA. So really low MA, um, longer times um, 
And anyways, we got to make sure that our exposures are um, less than 100 milligray per minute or 21 milligray per minute per MA. Uh, typical fluoroscopic exposure, best case scenarios, 20 milligray per minute at five times uh, five minutes of fluoro or 40 milligray per minute at two and a half minutes of fluoro, which adds up to approximately 100 milligrays entrance skin exposure. Alrighty, thank you for hanging in there for roughly this uh, first 20 minutes. Um, I will be adding on to this. Um, for my x-ray tech students, please read through this. Um, and then remember that I'm sending you all, I've sent you all the, um, the notes for this lecture so you can have them in front of you for review without me talking. In any case, thanks for listening and have a good day.